Terry, I know you're an electrician first and then you became a co-op, but really over the last 30 years or so, you've become a pioneer in what is called restorative justice. Now, let's start by your definition of what is restorative justice. I guess um, being a cop working in the criminal justice system, the notion of justice was a critical part of my whole experience. And uh, what I really got to understand uh, when I became a cop, largely we were dealing with people in crisis uh, who often did things that were not okay, they committed crimes, and uh, particularly young people. And I, I got to sense that working with young people meant that we actually had to create an awareness so that they understood that what they did actually affected relationships. So the notion of restorative it really has a really simple focus. It talks about what's happened, what impact it's had on relationships and how we need to f fix or repair it. Now, our criminal justice system is, is largely adversarial or punitive, okay, and the focus is what's happened, who's to blame and what punishment. And I discovered that we were seeing the same young people and I realised that we simply weren't opening them up. We weren't helping them to learn from the experience and therefore the potential for making different choices was pretty limited, particularly if they were kids who were struggling around their own relationships. So I guess what I did in the early 19 or late 80s, early 1990s was to, with my colleagues in a place called Wagga Wagga, we started to think what could we do differently that might start to engage young people in a way where they started to make different choices. And I guess broadly we looked at what the New Zealanders were doing and discovered what they call a family group conference process where they invited offenders and their families and victims. I guess that was the sum total of my understanding. But what I got to really understand is that at a really basic level where something had happened and people were impacted, if you got to talk about that impact, you're in a much better space to talk about what you could do to fix it. So the notion of restorative justice, as it was in the early days, was really about harm and relationships. And the notion of repair was about how we could begin to redress some of the hurts so that people could begin to move on and not become defined by what happened to them. To what extent then is the uh, notion of restorative justice really if you reduce it to its kind of basic simple elements about that matter of uh, being able to talk about what you've done in an environment that you feel safe in. You see, um, what began for me as a, as a program for dealing with young offenders has evolved significantly over the last 20 odd years and it, it's more about a relationship practice. So the notion of actually talking about things uh, is, is really fundamental to how we share the space, the world we live in. And that what I got to really understand really quickly was that one of the issues in our society when relationships are in conflict is not that conflict isn't a good thing, the issue is we often don't know how to do it in a way where we get to talk about it. And if the focus in talking about things is to talk about my story and for, for me to hear your story, that is how I've been impacted and how you've been impacted, it allows us to then get to experience one another in, as human beings and it gives rise to some hopeful outcomes. So. It's really a basic concept, that is when something happens, if we get to sit and talk about it in a respectful way, where we get to hear one another's story, we're more likely than not to be able to move forward. You had an experience in America which I'm interested in, and I wonder if you'd recap it for us, um, when in a room full of uh, prisoners, uh, a young prisoner approached you uh, 
and was somewhat surprised to learn that what he did had impact on his friends and family. It was a fascinating experience, but I guess it epitomises all that is fundamentally wrong with our criminal justice system. And I'm not suggesting for a minute we need to throw it out, but we actually need to change the practices. And this is a really good example where I was asked if I would explain this restorative process. But rather than do that, I actually asked someone to nominate the last offence they had committed. Now there were 70 prisoners, all black, six of them were in for life, so really serious offences. I asked who would share the last offence they had committed, and this guy put his hand up and said, you know, I shot a guy in a, in a bungle robbery, he was after drugs, the, the guy didn't die. I said, come out here, and there was a whiteboard, and I said, tell me who's in your family, and who do you think's in the victim family? With that information, I asked people to get into a circle, and I simply put some name tags, and all of these prisoners assumed a role, and I went into facilitation mode where I said, let's talk about what happened. What were you thinking at the time? What have you thought about? And who's been affected? When I got to the point where asking who's been affected, this young guy who I had noticed quite removed from the group yelled out, stop, stop. And with tears in his eyes, he came up to me, walked around, and he said, do you mean what I did affected my mum and my dad. And you know, what I took out of that is, is the reality that is the criminal justice system. When you isolate, you sanitise. And you don't involve those who are significant in their lives, where you don't get to talk about how their behaviour is actually imp impacted on those who are really important in life, forgetting about victims who are critically important in all of this, how do they then make a different choice? Who do they focus on when they're isolated? They learn how to survive. Does it help relationships? Of course it doesn't. Now the funny bit to that experience was I agreed I'd come back on the Saturday. I was due to go to New York and I came back on the Saturday because they wanted me to run another workshop. And as I approached, this guy ran up to me and I thought he was going to knock me over. And he hugged me in tears and he said, I've discovered my mum and my dad. I said, tell me what happened. He said, I rang my mum and I said to my mum, tell me what it's like for you with me being in there. And she burst into tears. She said, he said, we've had a very different conversation. And then spoke to my dad. Now... There's a lot of complexity around all of this. We, we, we're trying to keep it really simple. But when you isolate someone and humiliate and the shame involved in that, and then you don't involve family in a way where they can get to do with their shame, guess what happens? It's pretty hard to realistically imagine that we're going to bring about changes in behaviour or choices. I think we missed the point. That is that... You know, the moment we isolate someone from the social context and we don't levy on them any responsibility or obligations to deal with the hurt and the harm that happens, well, guess what? Nothing changes. Yet the irony of it all is how often do you hear magistrates and judges say, I want that offender to take responsibility and be accountable. You know, my difficulty is, what does that look like? If there's an absence of rituals, imagine you doing something, getting isolated from your community, and no one wants to talk to you, and there's nothing you can do that makes anything different. What do you end up doing? How do you deal with that shame and all those negative emotions in really quite destructive ways? So, you know... Whilst we talk about restorative justice, what we're talking about is, as a society, how do we build relationships in a way that allows us to deal with the grief and the conflict that happens in our daily lives? Um, and the answer is pretty simple. 
we have to talk about. Of course, you know, the, the general view in the community is that men are very bad at talking about their feelings anyway. Uh, so this is, there is a double uh, hindrance there. Can you, can you say how you found uh, a way to make people confront their shame and talk about it? How do people who are in that bad space, how do they get out of it themselves? Firstly, they have to be given the right opportunity. It has to be in a, in a context where it's respectful and it's safe. And they have to be given an opportunity to learn how to talk about things. So the basic questions I developed many moons ago, which form the basis of what we call a script, in a very simple way, go to the very heart of, tell me your story, what happened? What impact it's had? What's hard for you about this? Does it matter who it's being told to? It doesn't matter. Well, it, it, it does in a sense, um, in that individuals are not prepared to open up and to talk about things. You know, if, if they're scared, if the individual who's asking the question is not legitimate, um, So if, if I think about all my experience in terms of criminal justice, the majority of offenders who were incarcerated in our system, and frankly it's got nothing to do with rehabilitation, really have never got to tell their story. They've never got to validate their own story or to have it validated. Um, never got to deal with their shame in healthy and constructive ways never got to acknowledge the hurt they've caused, those who are significant in their lives. If we can change the story, we can change the experience. But the only way you can get to change the story is to have a really clear focus. And that is about, and it has to be built around respectful engagement. That is, I value you as a human being, even though your behaviour is not okay. But we need to talk about what this means for you. We need to talk about what it means for other people. And we need to talk about what obligations look like, which are very different to responsibility. We need to talk about how we can set you up to address those in a way that is not about this notion of responsibility, I need to be compliant, but it's about a relational basis on which I get a sense of what I've done is not okay and that there's a ritual or a process that allows me to demonstrate to others because I violate the trust that I can re-establish trust. Now, we're talking about something which, um, there are two elements here I'd like to ask you about. One is, it's, it's a process to redemption in a way that you're talking about. Uh, and redemption is a, is a very powerful uh, human experience. But I, and I want to talk about this, the separation of the person from what they've done, right. which seems to me very critical because a person can have build self-esteem on the good things they have in them as long as they're made to understand that, okay, what I did there was bad. I recognise that was bad, but it doesn't make me a bad person. Is that a kind of... Is that something that you've found a ritual to, to, overcome, to oh, work on? Look, I think it's fundamental. In fact, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a story in, in the Bible which talks about... Uh, the prodigal son, um, and if fundamentally we think about relationships, uh, and, and John Braithwaite is a fairly eminent Australian criminologist, he developed a sort of a theory in which he talks about processes that reintegrate and those that exclude, and he, he talks about uncoupling the act from the actor so that the focus 
clearly is on the unacceptability of the behaviour, but every attempt is made to maintain the intrinsic worth of the individual. Now, if you actually look at the criminal justice process, it doesn't uncouple that, and it isolates individuals. Okay? And so <coughs> his notion is that when you are cornered, it's a matter of the status you take is you reject the rejecter. And so it's, it continues that cycle. Uh, there's no redemption if there are no processes and rituals. So I often hear the expression, the offender has no remorse. Now, when I actually ask them, well, what do you mean by that? They say, well, you know, they have no empathy. And then I ask, um, I wonder why they have no empathy. And, and they talk about a character flaw or some sort of trait. When in fact, when, when you look at the criminal justice process, and I had an offender say to me once, in tears, I've served 12 months of a 10 year sentence. There's nothing I can do that remotely looks like taking responsibility. I said, tell me more about that. He said, I can't do anything that relieves other people's hurt or harm. Uh, and when I inquire about it, he said, it's just about me being compliant. You see, you know, when I, when I behave in a, in a really un, unhelpful, inappropriate way towards you, and I've really affected our relationships, my responsibility, my obligation, is to begin to uh, own that behaviour, but, but importantly, work towards repairing that relationship, if I value that relationship. Being an offender in a criminal justice system, where are the rituals? Both in terms of victims and in terms of those who are significant in their lives. So these would be significant changes that you'd like to see and would make a difference and that is to enable people to talk to both the victims uh, or those who were hurt by their actions and also to those around them who are close to them. Now, I wonder if you could, because we're talking about um, behaviour but we, we're really interested in this uh, what makes a man a man question. To what extent do you think the, the behaviour is influenced by past experience and to what extent do male role models for men or lack of influence people's behaviour? Do you know, um, I think that really goes to the core of it. You know, whether we accept it or not, we're products of our own history. And there's, there's this magnificent SBS program called Message Stick it's called Red Dust Hurling, in which a group of indigenous guys get together in a program in Taree where they get to actually be taken on a journey where they get to understand the shame, the hurt, not only they cause, but their history is caused to them. And they get to a point where they get to discover uh, that that they couldn't make sense of their own behaviour, uh, that they realised uh, having been rejected, the horrendous shame, they got into drugs, alcohol, ended up in prison, but never got to really understand what was happening for them. And why I'm saying that is individuals who make poor choices, as a general rule, are individuals who lack insight self-awareness. What we do in the criminal justice system is we don't build that self-awareness. We do quite the opposite. What I've discovered is that if you can engage individuals, whether they're offenders, no matter who they are, where they can get to understand what's happening for them. And we make an assumption that they know what they're on about, when in fact most of the time they don't. See, the issue about behaviour, for me, is just a manifestation of what's happening underneath. When people behave inappropriately, 
question I ask is, what's going on? You know, as a cop, you know, I was never mortally wounded by someone who called me all, all the names under the sun. I would say, what's that all about? And what I discovered was a lack of appropriate modelling. We, we make an assumption that people know what a different set of behaviours look like. Uh, why do we make that assumption? Because we automatically assume that people know right from wrong and therefore they know how to behave appropriately. Well, that's not the reality. If there's a complete absence of modelling or role models about decency, about thinking about the things that are expected of our society as a man, and that's changing, you know, I guess my concern is the role models we're seeing today, and I, I think of sport today, and the really heavy association of alcohol with it. And that seemed to be okay. Well, to me, as a, as a dad, as a man, I find that not okay. So whoever I've dealt with, particularly in terms of criminal justice system, with the odd exceptions, you know, when you look back the history, their history and their story, they've struggled around relationships. And, and a logical extension of that feeling, not okay about who they are, low self-esteem stuff, their way of dealing with their shame is to, is to hit out and hurt others. Um, it's not a choice they really want to make, but they've just learned to survive life in that way. What we're trying to do is to create an experience in which they get to live life. They can be changed. I'm interested in, in your story, um, the role models you had as a, as a kid growing up, what did you learn? What, 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 was, what was it that you found in your world that made you who you are? A very Catholic upbringing, one of ten kids, five boys, five girls, uh, wonderful loving family, wonderful mum who, uh, who never had a formal education, had a dad who was a a engine driver, but in his own way, a kid who left school at 11 um, during the Depression, did it really tough. Pretty hard-edged as a dad, but um, in his own way, very loving. But actually, um, was always pretty philosophical. Um, he was a trade union guy, very grassroots, but um, did I'm, I'm curious about what you learned from the way he behaved to uh, your mother and to you and your siblings. I, I guess he was very supportive. Um, sometimes with conflicts, he struggled a bit around that. wasn't overly good at talking about things, but. Um, But he was important, and I guess there was one critical thing he always said that I think had a huge influence on me, and that was um, judging others is, is easy, getting it right is, is, a, is a completely different thing. And I guess that sort of philosophy I embraced in particularly you know, when I went into policing, I always felt people were in crisis. And I fundamentally looked for ways in which I could help them to work it out. So the sort of restorative justice element is a f more formalised approach I mm. took when dealing with policing issues. You know, I remember an occasion where I, I got hit King hit by a, a young guy in a in a dance, and I'd come as a cop to to do with some issues, and uh, and he actually knocked me down. I didn't see it coming, and I had been tempting early to remove him because he was intoxicated and he was disruptive. Anyhow, my colleague at the time, 
my eye sort of almost closed up. And um, he, he said, oh, we'll, we'll take him to, uh, uh, and we'll charge him with assault, etc. And I said, no, we'll take him to his home. And I took him home and I met his mum and I said, I'd like you to come in tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock. We're going to talk about it. Now my colleague said, I can't understand that. I said, look, I know a little bit about this young fellow, but more importantly, what's going to help more? The idea that we can talk about it. It doesn't exclude the idea of a charge. And when his mum came in, and of course my eye was black, my wife couldn't believe I, I would go to work looking right. But anyhow, I did, and we sat down and we talked about it. And his mum cried, she talked about the shame of all of this, and the fact that her husband had died six months earlier, and everything was a struggle. Really interesting, I ran into that young kid 20 years later, and he said, I still can't work out why you didn't charge me. And I said, tell me, tell me about life since. He said, I've never been in trouble since. So the sort of philosophy that I, I, I guess took from my dad and my mum was to consider others and be, and be considerate. And what I got to do is I worked as an electrician, I worked in some really remote locations and I was exposed to the sharp end of life with grog and fights and all the rest of it. And I always wondered, what's that all about? When I got to really get to the bottom of it, it was about relationships and individuals' inability to deal with the fallout of being estranged, isolated. So what made you decide to become a cop in the first place? Well, I was really good looking at the time, so uh, that was a great help, <laughs> even though I'm probably the only one who thinks so. Look, I... Uh, I liked, it appealed to me because I thought this is something where I'd have flair a gift for working with and helping people. Had you noticed that in when you were an electrician, how did that come about? Mainly because I, um, I was a hard working young kid and in fact I've worked hard all my life but, but because I came from a loving and supportive family, I got exposed to the other side of the track, as they would say. And what I got to do was to talk to people. I was critically interested in stories about how did you get to this place? Tell me about your journey. And what I got to do is to, to understand if you ask well-crafted questions, you get to discover who people are. And because you did that, people became really interested in you and you could as a base on which you could really get to understand what was happening for them. Let me ask you a personal question, another personal question. In your own personal life, your relationships, uh, are they guided by and, uh, if you like, informed by your professional attitude? Well, I've got seven kids myself. And, and You've I've, got three more to go. <laughs> yeah, and I've got, I've got five grandkids and I guess I've worked really hard at that but because I'm a, a vulnerable human being I don't always get it right but what I've learned is my kids remind me in very clear terms when I actually don't get it right and, and I, I guess as a dad someone asked me you know what am I proud of I said well my age my kids still talk to me and, and look, I, I feel very confident and I know that the, the, the sort of experience I've had has been critical in terms of the relationships we share. You know, uh, I, I love my wife and my kids and, and we, we're indeed blessed. But it's like anything that has to do with relationships. It's always hard work. So really the bottom line, the, the, the secret, the mantra that you uh, promulgate is talk. Talk about it, tell your story, share your story with people you trust. 
And to make that happen, the criminal justice system needs to change to allow that to happen, encourage that to happen. Can it still happen in today's system? Does it happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. See, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really an industry. And in fact, if you think about, uh, at a political level, the mantra, the law and order, to be tougher and harder. Now, you know, I'm not a rocket scientist, but Einstein talked about the first sign of insanity is to continue doing what you've always done. You know, I hope that you would get a different outcome. Well, well you aren't. You see, if, if we could just step back and think about how we could change the conversations within the criminal justice system, you know, within all the existing constraints, you know, I'm not talking about throwing it out, I'm just talking about how we change the experiences, we'd end up with very different outcomes. You were saying that you sometimes get it wrong. Yeah. Give us a couple of examples and how do you then make it right? Do you know, uh, when, when I look back, um, my mum, who was, was, was a saint, um, a hard-working mother of ten, I mean, uh, she did things the hard way. Uh, whenever I'd goof off, she wouldn't necessarily raise her voice, but she'd give me the look. And when you got the look, the head would go down and you'd feel really awful. Because, you know, I didn't care what happened, but when I disappointed my mum, there was nothing worse. What I got to learn from that was, uh, that's uh, an experience of where shame kicked in. And why shame becomes important is I've learnt that it's the base on which we build and maintain healthy relationships. So when I do something and I feel awful about it, I feel ashamed of, you know. A healthy relationship allows you to stay with the moment, to realise that something I've done is not okay. Uh, there's, the spotlight has actually been thrown onto my behaviour. I can still feel okay about who I am. My mum still loved me, okay. But I would learn from that experience. Now. Wonderful, because if we didn't get to experience shame, there wouldn't be any boundaries. We'd be psychopaths. We wouldn't know what feeling good was like. But there's, there's a flip side to it, and that is that when we can't stay with the moment and we get to feel awful about it and we can't open up and do with it in a healthy and constructive way, there are four ways in which you like it to respond. Nathan calls it the compass of shame. What do we do? We withdraw, we play no speakies. Now, so typical of my response might be with my wife, is there's been an incident, okay, and we haven't heard one another, and so I'll just withdraw from the scene. Not helpful at all, okay. But when I get over the sulking bit, we can get to sit down and we can talk about it. So that's a withdrawal response. The other response is avoidance response or denial. Okay, now in our society, uh, drug and alcohol is one way of ameliorating our pain. Okay, now the good news is that since I've been alive, I've never drunk, which was really unusual being a cop for all the time and being a sportsman. Um, I've never drunk. So my way of avoidance is just to do anything to distract me from what the real issue was. Okay. The other two responses are equally as destructive. One is to attack self. You know, you know, I'm not, I'm not a very nice person. I tend not to do that. Or the other one is to attack others. Okay, which is to vent, to hurt others. Sadly, in our society, a lot of what's happening can be explained within the compass of shame. The gratuitous violence, individuals who are isolated, whose sense of self is diminished, what do they tend to do? Attack others, you know? That's, this is what road rage is about. If you actually look at what happened uh, in Columbine or Virginia Tech and you start to profile those individuals, their sense of shame is so overwhelming that no amount of alcohol could ameliorate it. Basically, they didn't have anyone to talk about. When you don't get to talk about it, 
it finds expression in really unhelpful ways. So I, I tend to, you know, with, with the kids sometimes, I, I'm not necessarily the angry type, okay? But I've learnt through this whole process to be much more respectful in terms of being able to challenge them. And my kids know, for example, as we're going up, when there was an incident, for example, my, my kids are pretty sporty, kicking the, the soccer ball out on the road. People have got prize roses, the old couple, they've damaged the rose, they're really upset. So we sit around and we talk about it. Bring all the kids in. Okay, we sit and we talk about it. So <laughs> I ha actually happened to, in, in my other life, run lots of workshops for parents because I work in schools. And what began as a discreet program for dealing with offenders and victims in criminal justice has evolved to a much more relational practice where, it, where I try and use it to underpin everything I do. Um, and we get to share it with parents and we do it in a way that we actually give them a really simple card. And on that card are the questions I developed many moons ago. And all that I say, it doesn't matter whether I'm working with parents, uh, any professional, I just say, try this card, change the conversation you have with someone, and you'll end up changing the experience. So the, 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 the lessons of life can be used, and it, they can be used, and what you're talking about is getting them early, in this case the educational system, which you do a lot of work in the educational system, because at that point, that's where role modelling and that's, where, that's what the kids are seeing, how their parents behave. To, to, to what extent then are you able to answer this question or how would you attempt to answer this question, what makes a man a man? See, I, I think that the experiences I and others have developed that has provided us with a really simple relational framework and, and I guess I've worked in literally thousands of schools throughout the world, I've got to actually understand that if the name of the game is about teaching and learning and that relationships are the central plank on which that takes place and we can use this to help teachers, students and parents to build much better relationships. So they get to actually experience a modelling process which they get to learn how to talk to one another and they get to learn what taking responsibility looks like because guess what? Lots of things that happen in the school mirror, schools mirror what happens in the criminal justice system. I have teachers say to me, oh Terry, kids say sorry and they think that's the end of it. And I say, what would the end of it look like? And they'd say, taking responsibility. And I said, what would that involve? What would that look like? Well, you know what I mean. I don't know what you mean. What are you talking about? And the reality is, the assumption is that everyone knows what taking responsibility is about. And then when we when we drill it down, we get to discover they levy an expectation, but there are no rituals or processes in which that can be made to happen. So, here's the bottom line in terms of our schooling experiences. Offering a framework that makes explicit, for example, a card is an explicit set of questions that not only do the teachers share, but we give it to the, the children, the students, and we give it to the parents. So we can develop a common language in practice that does really well at developing the right conversations. So we get to deepen the understanding and build strong relationships. And funnily enough, when you create the conditions that are supportive of teaching and learning, you get much better academic outcomes. There's a spin-off benefit. There is. And one, one of the difficulties is that the moment you start to isolate behaviour and you have a whole lot of 
anti-bullying programs, all the rest of it, I think we missed the point. The focus needs to be how do we, in a very proactive way, focus on things that help build and sustain relationships. Now recently I had a group of Year 5 students, 120 of them, and I said, um, imagine today was the last day of your primary schooling, you're actually in Year 6, and as a group, what are you most going to remember? Our relationships. And I said, imagine that you've been together for seven years, and as you look around, you discover you never had a conflict, a fight, or a disagreement. What would that be like? A little fellow put his hand up and said, uh, boring. Then this little girl with a quite troubled look on her face, she said, it, it wouldn't be very good at all. I said, why is that? She said, how would you know how to build relationships? I then said, tell me more about that. <clears throat> she said, my mum said to me, that conflicts either make you stronger or you drift apart. So I said to the students, tell me who's changed their friendship group since kindergarten. And they all put their hand up. I said, what's that about? And you know what they said? We weren't able to work it out. I said, why weren't you able to work it out? And they said, because we didn't talk about it. See, if we talk about the gender difference in terms of how men and women deal with emotions. The only way we can address that is to create the space in which we can learn what the right conversations look like. And one of the things we're trying to encourage teachers is to be much more explicit, deliberate and intentional and to create the space in which kids can learn what being a stakeholder in a classroom community looks like. Don't have an expectation that's going to happen if you don't create the space. And what we're discovering is when kids can get to learn how to have the right conversations, to build the right conversations, they get to deal with differences, you know, in, in very healthy, constructive ways. So the conflict generally becomes an opportunity for learning. You know, the difficulty is we live in a world where it's about blame and shame which shuts people down, excludes them. And then when, when you don't feel heard, guess what happens? It manifests itself in really unhelpful ways. So I, you, you haven't answered my question directly, or one of my questions directly, and I wonder if there is an answer to what makes a man a man. Is it possible to, in, in so many words, answer that? Or are there too many words? You know, from my experience, um, when, when, I, when I look back on, on what it was about myself uh, that allowed me to be different in, in, in terms of my, my worldview, etc., is I actually grew up in a fairly loving, supportive environment where my sense of self was that I were, you know, I was, a, I was an okay kid, you know. Uh, you were I, valued and yeah, respected. Yeah, I, I, I felt loved and as a result, I actually got to look at life from that perspective. One of the difficulties is that many others haven't had that experience. But it doesn't mean they can't change. What I am convinced of is that history is only helpful if it helps us to think about what going forward looks like. And my argument really strongly is if we change the conversations, we change the experience. If we can help individuals to make sense and meaning of who they are, they're going to be in a much better space to be able to make judgments. And, and I guess what I'm hopeful is that when we get to tell new stories, and this is a new story, we get to change the experiences that individuals have. So 
what makes a man a man is there. My answer to that is, is largely determined by the capacity to relate. Um, the one issue that I've always prided myself on is that um, I had a, a really great relationship with my mum and, and therefore I, I've always appreciated the gender differences. I think sadly in a world where conflict is so rampant that war is symptomatic of the breakdown of those key relationships, women often become the first victims and all of that. And as a cop dealing with family violence, um, I always felt the bit missing was the conversation that needed to be had. But we, 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 we tended to isolate individuals and put them into anger management programs when in fact they had no insight in terms of how their behaviour impacted on others. And there was no capacity for them to have a different experience around those they'd hurt. Um, so fr from my perspective, there isn't anything you can't resolve if given the opportunity to talk about.